Well, welcome everyone to the show. It's great to have you here again, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Thank you for taking time to listen. Uh, Stan, I'm super excited. We're starting a new series. We just got done with What Advisors Fear. Got some great feedback from folks. Uh, And we're going to start a new series uh, called Learn the Hard Way. And this was your idea. So kudos to you. And if it's not a good idea, then it was Stan's idea. I was driving the truck and I was just getting all these uh, flashes of things I've done the wrong way. And I was like, wait, we should talk about those. Yeah. uh, And then we have suggestions from uh, members as well. So the goal is learning a lesson the hard way is okay as long as you do it once. Once. Um, And I think often, and I have kids and I think about this and I look back to when I was a kid and how frustrating it would have been where it's like, if you would just listen to me. Yeah. It would save you so much pain, but many of us have to learn some things the hard way. So two things I think that you had pointed out to me, which is one, when you do make the mistake, um, you know, write it down and document it so you can go back. And it's almost almost like a physical etching in your memory. Like r- write down the things that you didn't do well, mm-hmm. you wish you would have known, you wish you would have done better. That That is, that that's fine. The other is, uh, and they say experience is the best teacher, but other people's experience could also be your teacher. So that's where we're going to take your experience, some of our members' experiences, and uh, why not learn from them learning the hard way, right? That's our hope for the show today. And there's going to be things in business that you just believe is, are going to be different for you and you're going to press forward. <laughs> so we're not going to completely remove uh, learning lessons the hard way. But I think by hearing it, somebody else's experience this is why we're big advocates of reading books, because what it does is just raises your awareness. Mm-hmm. And so as we go through, we're going to go through four of these today. As you hear it, you may relate to it. If if you're like, I've been there, done that, our mind should automatically go to like, how do we avoid doing it again? Uh, Is it something where we write down, it's become part of our process? How do we protect ourselves from ourselves? Well, let's dive right in. And the goal is to avoid uh, those moments where we look back and like, what was I thinking? I want to give you permission to pause today. Uh, I do this with shows and, and my go-to, I don't know what yours is, uh, but my go-to is I just use the Apple reminders, but I will literally say, hey, I'm afraid to say it because I don't want my phone to be triggered, but I'll yeah. say hello to <laughs> the, the 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 phone and I'll say, set a reminder for so-and-so at so-and-so time, you know, to go do this or to write this down mm-hmm. or when I get That's home, good. remind me to do this. So I want to give you permission as you're listening to us, like if we say something, you're like, I need to do that, then yep. stop and do it. Yep. It's not texting and driving though. But no, no, that's why I use the voice. All right, so the first one uh, is process protects us from ourselves. Process will protect you from yourself. What's the lesson there that you've had to learn the hard way? So when it was just me and I was an advisor doing everything, everything rose and fell based on how I was doing that day. What do you mean by how you're doing? What energy I was bringing. So life is complicated for all of us. And so what I don't want to do, because I've heard other coaches do this, is speak about business in like a vacuum. Yeah. Of like, just do this all the time. It's going to be great. And it's like, yeah, but what if my kid's in the hospital? Or last night I was up till 3. Like there's so many variables right. to like, what am I bringing to the table each day? Yeah. And so as we talk about in today's context, I don't want you, I don't want to argue with anybody that this is true, because let's just agree it's true. Right. Is that life is complicated and there's really hard days. Yes. And so for me... I had to realize that, and this became with team members and different processes, that like I fall back to my process. So if I come in to an office one day and for whatever reason I'm just off, I'm not bringing the energy I want to bring, I will fall to whatever process I've put in place with my team. And if there's no process? You make mistakes. <laughs> and so for me, a big one, big prospect, uh, great direct warm referral from another great client. Like it was just teed up. Mm-hmm. For all intents and purposes, it was like this is this is a done deal. And as a result of that, just being probably too confident in myself, hey, you know, these people know who I am. I've already had a bunch of value for these other people. I rushed out my proposal. I came back. I even think I did mostly in kind of email format loose. It wasn't the formal one. It was more of like, hey, just let me know if you're good with this. We'll get together and finalize it. But I'd only had one and a half meetings with the client. There was so much work to be done that to them, the what I later found out, and this client still may be a client someday, is that they heard one or two things I said in that first meeting and they associated my entire fee with those two things and it stalled them out because they're like, that's just a, 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 that's an expensive investment for only that stuff. But for me, I just didn't give myself an extra meeting or a couple more days to flush it out and explain it more. Mm -hmm. And so missed out on a big opportunity there. And I've done that multiple times until we fix the process to where now the team knows if if a proposal is going out too quickly, Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it shouldn't. It doesn't mean it's not a good proposal. It just means it should trigger some questions. 
Like, Sten, why are we doing this so quick? Hey, did you have enough time to think about this? Did you explain enough to the client? And so for me, when it comes to process, it just protects me Yeah. from those days where I'm just like rushing something or not following through. And as your team grows, it's really important for them to know because they'll be the stopgap in that stuff. I think about recipes that are proven, you know, and I remember as a child seeing a recipe mm -hmm. for brownies and I wanted some brownies. And I was like, oh, you got to put them in for I don't know, 28 minutes or something like that at 350. Mm -hmm. And I saw my oven went a lot higher and I wanted them faster. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and so I just was like, well, if I add, I probably did some math. You know, if I add, if I want them 30% faster, I'll turn it up. So I went, put it up to like 500 and I thought to be done. <laughs> Why are you yeah. laughing? I'm just Brilliant, kidding. dude. Did not work. I'm laughing because I never thought of that. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're smart. <laughs> but obviously it doesn't work. You, you, there's, a, there's a certain time and temperature and, you know, like all these factors that have to be in place. And, and, and yeah, sometimes you can adjust the variables, yep. but a lot of times like that rules in place because that's what works. And mm -hmm. it's a matter of creating what works and, and you live this out, we live this out in our business, but there are versions of things. It's not like you're always going to keep it that mm -hmm. way, but the baseline, as you said, I love this is we will default to our process when we are not at our best. Yep. And the great thing is if you have a good process you don't have to be your best and it's still going to work. I know that there's pilots that are flying right now and when they got in the plane, they were thinking about the fight they had with their husband or they were thinking about, you know, uh, you know, they were talking, thinking about, they don't feel that well today or whatever, but they got in there and they went through their checklist mm -hmm. and they took off and the f flight was fine because they have a checklist. That's right. They never skipped the checklist, right? So I think it's about defaulting to that. And part of that makes me think of like personal rules you have for yourself. Yeah. Like one for me is I used to, I didn't really shy away from conflict ever. And so if there's something that went sideways with a team member or even a teammate, like I'm like, let's talk about it right now. Mm. I've since learned and from wise people, it's like it never benefits you to do it in the moment when tensions are high. Mm. The idea of like, I always give it a day or two to like calm down, gather my thoughts. That's a rule I'm trying to follow because I'll still be like, let's just solve it because we all want to do it right now versus a, a rule, practical way of implementing this would be like, I don't have that conversation. I always give myself at least 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Even if you feel like it in the moment, if you can put rules in place that protect you from yourself, yeah, you, you'll always be better off. Saying something slower, almost always better. Holding things back, almost always better. Yeah, Give yourself a little more time. It forces you to slow down. Yeah. Some other things that you, you had told me about... Um it limits distractions or it eliminates distractions. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm going to go do this, this, and this. Okay, that's fine. But like, you get back to the list. We didn't check that box. We have to check that box because yep. we do get distracted. That's right. There is an element of safety for you and for the business. You're protecting yourself when you go through your due diligence, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think about, I was uh, emailing a, a member of EAN today and it was a copy of a form that you use with your uh broker dealer like the idea of like oh we have to have this in place to document this like that's important you don't yeah. skip past that it's really important to have those documentation and for me it's a who not how that's just not what i get excited about my superpower is not process right and so the the for me it was forcing myself to do it until i found somebody that was really good at it yeah so the ultimate goal you may not like it that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it but as quickly as possible be successful in what you're doing so you can kind of put somebody in behind you absolutely that thrives in that absolutely so here's another one about learning the hard way. Uh, never meet alone. Mm -hmm. I, this is one that uh, I think that people, well, there's some different aspects to this, some different solves for this, but the, the core, what is the core principle behind never meet alone? Why, why is not being in a meeting alone uh, such an important principle that, that every advisor who's hearing our voice should should follow that advice? I was never able to fully connect with the client or unpack the things they were saying when I was also concerned about taking the notes for mm -hmm. later. And so I was always looking up and down, writing it down, always missing something, never fully finishing a thought because we were on there asking me a question. And so this is something I adopted quite a while ago when it started with an admin assistant being in a meeting at times and moved to a paraplanner or you know junior advisor in there with me because I want to be fully in the moment. Like, I want to be asking questions. I want to be whiteboarding. And if somebody's there observing it, taking notes, they also give me feedback. Today, we had a meeting actually this morning yeah. and Nate was in the meeting and he was like, when you stood up and, and started teaching that, the, the client's energy changed completely. 
And I know that just from being there. The, the the client just kind of sat up in their chair. Right, they were right. a little more. I was going to clarify. They weren't like, "Oh, boring." You know, no, no, no. They, they were just like, "Oh, this is happening." Like, right. we're not just sitting here talking to each other the whole right. time. And Nate's a newer advisor, so for him to notice, like, wow, that changed yeah. what was going on, and to give me that active feedback. Yeah. And whenever they're passing me forms, I pass them over to Chris, and he puts them, and I'll mention to him, "Hey, make a note about that." It's just such a better, more effective meeting. Yeah. When I'm fully present. Yeah. And so when we teach advisors, whether it's our trainings or in our community. As quickly as possible, you need to have somebody else in the room with you. Right. I I think that again, one thing you might think as you're listening to us, well, I I I don't miss out on details. I'm really good. We're not talking about missing out on the details. Mm-hmm. We're talking about missing out on the connection because mm-hmm. when you don't have to worry about the details, whether it's Stan or you who are listening or watching on YouTube, like when you don't have to worry about the details, you can really be fully engaged mm-hmm. in the conversation. That's right. Right, you don't have to stop. Imagine in an interview with someone, uh, you know, imagine you're interviewing someone and you're doing a television show, and it's like, hold on, let me stop and write that down. Like that kind of ruins so the just flow. Join it, that's right. Right, and so you want to be able to f- be fully present. Yeah, you might have to make some notes, but also you can say, uh, you know, what was that number again? And you can say it to someone else, right, right, who was in the meeting. So the solves for that are an admin, a parent planner, junior advisor, partner advisor uh, that you clearly decide ahead of time who's doing what. Right. You know, one of my superpowers is me up coaching and teaching on the whiteboard, but the other partner is the analytical one that needs to have all the notes because they're the one building the plan next. Right. Like, just talk about it. What's great about the progression of that is that they then get to take those notes and put them into our system for me, which mm-hmm. is not the best use of 10 to 15 minutes of Sten's time after. So if I can operate in the context of like Sten is here to teach, coach, and do what he does best, but then somebody else is taking notes and plugging them in and running with a follow-up email, yeah, that at per meeting, that saves me at least an hour. And it's a separate superpower. I mean, someone to take that data and then analyze it and put it into a plan, that's a superpower. Like you need to be really good at mm-hmm. taking a bunch of numbers and, and creating a story yep. and a plan. And that's not yours. That's not that's not where you thrive and get energy. Nope. It's not the best use of your time. So find someone whose it is and use them. Yeah, and, and a lie I used to tell myself is that everybody thinks the way I think or everybody enjoys the things I enjoy meaning every advisor on my team wants to be doing what I'm doing, right. and they don't. Some of them want to build plans, and they live in that. They don't want to be up on the board teaching and fielding hard questions, and they'll never probably get to a point where they enjoy that. So that's okay. So then as you build your team out around you, you're going to find people that they love doing what I don't like doing, mm-hmm. and that's an ideal team. Yeah. All right, how about another one? Um, we've talked about this, I think, before on the show, but this idea of have three, then set them free. Mm-hmm. So... I know you've talked about having the file literally kind of the bottom drawer of the desk. You'd pull it open and you call it, I think they call it like a, a tickler file or whatever. What's it called? Like, you remember that phrase? No, really that. <laughs> no, but the idea is that you have to sort of, you have to kind of wake it up. Like you have to like always be, oh, yeah. always be in the drawer. Like I, oh, call, I, just, I call it a drip folder, but yeah, whatever. That sounds uh, a little cleaner. I think like we just got <laughs> rated uh, inappropriate on YouTube. Nice. We just got demonetized. We got the E. We got the, yeah, e we got the, e, the explicit nice. lyrics thing. This is uh, like the third episode. We got the explicit thing to tag on. Which you're funny not is, doing it right. We should put the explicit upset. like on there. We should put it on there. <laughs> what did they say today? Just, um, what about our 12 year old financial advisors that are watching? The show? <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry. sorry, moms and dads. But the the lesson learned the hard way, and I, I want to break it down. I think there's some different kinds of people that the the L, the L, the, the element of this is that you have three conversations that are substantive or contacts Mm -hmm. and they don't take action. So that's, that's the common thing that's going on here. But I think there's different reasons that people don't take action. I think one, you might run into people. There are some people who just will not take action. They're just like, Oh yeah. Call me in two months. Mm -hmm. Yep. Call me a month. Yep. Call me next week. But they're stringing you along. Yeah. And then the challenge there, and I had to learn that it usually wasn't their fault more. So I wasn't communicating enough urgency for them to take action. Mm. So whenever possible, I want something to be in my control. So either I'm pursuing somebody that I don't serve well and they don't see the value, uh, or two, they're an ideal client. I just didn't communicate the value very well. Uh, or three, there are people that are just in the business of relationship and they like to go to dinners and do stuff, but they're never going to leave their cousin that's their advisor somewhere else and yeah. you need to ask better questions to determine the, pro- the probability this is going to be a successful interaction as soon as possible. Yeah. For me, I would have loved if early in my career somebody gave me permission to do this because the default in our industry is like, just keep calling them forever. Yeah. And over time, you'll wear them down or maybe you will say something by chance that they decide to do something with you and you can't build an elite business 
by dripping on people that aren't taking action. And so for me, within our coaching community, we we decided together, you know, three, whether it's a meeting, a Zoom call, or a substantial phone call, like within yeah. three touch points, if you cannot get them to take action in some way, then you need to move on. Yeah. One, because there's other opportunity. And if you don't think that's true, you know, that's scarcity mindset. Yeah. You've got to deal with that. Two, they're just not ready. And you'll put them in some longer term drip folder so they know you're still there when they need you. Yeah. Or you say, okay, I, I, I dropped the ball somewhere in there. I need to fix my process to communicate urgency so they take action faster. Yeah. For you, you may say, okay, it's four for me. It shouldn't probably be five plus, but you need some rule that avoids you from having the drip folder to where I'd look at that thing. And there's people I called for years. Yeah. And they never did anything. And that just was a waste of time and also just kind of messed with my mindset. Of like I'm calling these people, they just keep saying no. I should have moved on and go. I, I yes, think about this, and you know, I, I think about there are certain people I asked out in my life on a date, and it's like I didn't go. Well, I'm gonna ask them again in a, in a month, and then another month. Like at some point, you're just like, <laughs> you know what? I have enough rejection in my life. I'm not gonna go pursue it. That's right. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but hypothetically speaking, of course. <laughs> no, that's real, bro. <laughs> that's real. Some real stuff. But I, I think that there's something to be said about like being good with follow-up. Yeah. And there's also something to be said for like, hey, listen, you gave it a shot. They That wasn't the right time for them. And they mm-hmm. say, hey, maybe another time, great. Put them on the email list. Uh, you know, maybe someone else calls them, uh, you know, once a year or something. But I know yeah, that the there's The trap people, is activity. It created right. a bunch it of It feels like you're doing activity. something. That's right. Right? And I know there's people in our, and this is true of almost every element of business. Like there's people who are part of a lead advisor network. And I looked at someone recently because they just emailed us a question. We're sort of getting more involved in the community. They signed up for our email list two years ago, and they just sent us a question for the podcast mm-hmm. like last week. And I'm thinking, man, for two years, they've been a part of sort of the community, yeah. right? But we have systems at scale so that when they do want to reach out to us, they can. Mm-hmm. And again, just trust that you don't have to go chasing people who are really not that interested in you. Yep. Your time is more valuable. There are other people out there. That's right. Last one is pursuing hard conversations. Mm. This is huge. I'm sure there's 20 episodes we could do about this, but let's just... How did you learn the hard way that you have to pursue? And I think the key word there is pursue. Mm-hmm. Why Why would you tell people you've got to pursue hard conversations? And how did you learn the hard way by not having them? This is a lesson I've learned the hard way a hundred times. Hmm. Um, I think a, a natural part of my personality, whether born or developed over time, is just people-pleasing. Like I check, uh, I'm okay if everyone's okay, which isn't healthy because you can't control if everybody's right. okay. Right. But I think there's something to be said about like, can you sense other people and and respond to that in a good way? So I think there's there's a strength in that. But if the goal is to always make everybody else okay, therefore you're overthinking their potential response to what you're experiencing. Therefore, anything you're feeling or experiencing always has to be kind of internally processed. That's not good for a relationship. It's not good for a team. That's not good. They just what it creates is kind of this aura of unknown. This like, there's something in the air that nobody can put their finger on. And so for me, I had to learn, and there was a progression for me. One, just avoid it and do whatever I thought needed to be done in the moment to make the other person appear happier. Mm. To two, leaning in too hard and too fast, people getting on the defensive, you know, especially, you know, if you come across in such a way to where it's like, yeah, you're freaking me out. To a further progression that I'm working on now to where it's curiosity. Hmm. It's, hey, for, I'm sensing this. That means it's it may not be true, but based on, based on our lack of communication, I feel like you might be perceiving this. Is that true? Right. So and there's so a the lack of clarity, are less, but you're going to go pursue it. It's a, You sense it. Maybe it shows up in their production. Mm-hmm. Maybe it shows up in their work. Maybe it shows up in the lack of communication. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost like there's an absence of something, and that's what you have to go, hey, hey, there's, there's, this, there's something gray here, or there's mm-hmm. something missing, or something being unsaid. Or I or I I believe this to be true, or I yeah. feel this because I could be wrong, yeah. And it could be just some of my internal stuff, limiting yeah. beliefs or head trash, or me are causing me to paint a picture that's not true, right? And we all do that. We all fill in a bunch of blanks and make a bunch of assumptions and paint a picture that if we went to and asked the person, they'd be like, "No, that's not true at all." Yeah. And so for me, I, I had to get better at just being curious, even though I felt like, man, I totally have this thing figured out. I totally know what they're doing. Like this is the obvious story that's happening. Is to go and be like, hey, this is why I'm feeling. Is this, do you feel this way too? They're not leading questions. It's not. There's definitely a, an art to this. I'm trying to figure out. But especially if you lead a team or work with clients that are hard, just saying like, hey, this is what I'm hearing you say. Is this what you mean? 
Yeah. Like, are you telling me this is what you're looking for? Are you, are you telling me you want to have more meetings, but you don't want to pay me to do more for you? That As opposed to like, hey, you're taking advantage of me, right. which may be the feeling I'm having. But when it comes to team, relationships, family members, leading into hard conversations with curiosity is it, something that's taken me way too long to figure out, and I'm still working on it. But too often we see leaders and advisors to where it's like an assumption followed by an accusation that leads to this whole twisted mess that you've been on the calls with some people and you've had somebody on the team, somebody over here on the team on the same Zoom call and you ask one question Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it facilitates a conversation that should have happened a year ago. Yeah. And so what seems basic is obviously difficult for most of us. And so if, if if you're listening and this is something you can identify, I think all of us struggle with it. But if you're to a place where you're like, hey, I'm willing to say that's a that's something I struggle with, then you need to come up with some kind of system to where whenever there's a sense, because you need to learn to trust your gut. Hopefully it's like, hey, my gut's telling me questions need to be asked, not that my gut's always right. Right. Is that if you can get better at, you know, being curious about what's going on around you, curious with team members, clients, in relationships, rarely will you get in trouble. They may overreact in the moment. Hopefully you don't overreact back. Asking questions when they need to be asked right. can usually churn something up, and the outcome is usually better. Even if it's harder right away and that person leaves, it's probably still better long term. I like questions. Let's get practical before we wrap up here. Um, I, I like the question, um, and it's sort of a statement plus question, so I'll give you a couple. One of them is, hey, I'm sensing something right now, or I'm sort of feeling something, and I don't know that I don't know that I, it's right. I don't know if it's accurate or not, mm-hmm. and so I'll, I, I just want to talk about it because I don't, I don't like sort of the ambiguity, ambiguity or the, I just don't like not knowing what really what's going on, and, and I totally could be wrong, and so yeah. I'd like for us to just talk about it. Are you okay with that? Mm-hmm. And they go, yeah, what is it? And you say, well, here's what I'm sensing, feeling, seeing, mm-hmm. and then stop before you say, and this is why I think it's happening, <laughs> but just stop and say, what are your thoughts on that? And they might, they might say something like, you, you nailed it, you totally understand, yep, or they might go, man, that's not what I meant at all, yeah, that's right? right? Nope. Uh, another one is just come to them and say, hey, can you help me? And this has to come out of a genuine place, not just like I got you, but hey, can you help me understand something and then ask specific questions? Like mm-hmm. I see this happening, this happening, like what do you, what do you see happening? Like am I am I seeing that right? Nice. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and be prepared for the person to respond in the way they think you want to hear. Oh, interesting. At times when there's a, a, a dynamic in a relationship to where it's, you're the boss, I'm the team member. Yeah. The first time you do this, they're not going to be like, oh, I've been waiting years for this. And they're just yeah. going to like open up. Yeah. They may still tell you what they think you want to hear for a while. And so give it time. But also, because I, I interact with people like this too, that whenever you are with them, they will say one thing and around other people, they'll say something else. Mm. And, and the hope is, is you can kind of confront that a little bit until there's a chance that it's just not okay. Yeah. Culturally, it's not a good fit. Like it's your responsibility to put stuff on the table and create it a safe place for that conversation to be had. Yeah, like here's a space for us to just be honest with each other. Now, mm-hmm. whether someone uses that space to be honest or that's not right. is that's a variable. Like yep. you you don't know. But I will I will also say and I love that point you brought up and this is I uh, this is not written anywhere in scripture or on in stone anywhere, but I think it to be true. I think this is true that almost always the the, the quicker someone answers, the more sort of defensive or they're, they're feeling attacked or they're feeling overpowered because mm. I've worked with people where when I would ask them a question, they would immediately go, well, da 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 and, and it's because they were scared or they were feeling attacked or they were feeling mm-hmm. like overpowered. And I would say this, I do it. Like when someone asks me something, if I try to answer real quick, it's because I'm trying to be defensive or justify or explain yeah, myself. It was triggered. Like it's a yeah. trigger response. Yeah, yeah. Versus yeah. sitting there and going, and I really, maybe I did really screw that up. Like, why? Well, yeah, like that. I'm not doing a good job at that. Or I understand why you would, mm-hmm. I understand why that would bother you versus like, no, no, no let me tell you exactly why I did that. Right. right. There's a good reason for that. Um, and at times you need to lean in more. I've had times where I've said, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I heard somebody say something different. Mm. I really want to make sure we're on the same page. So are you telling me that this is not the case? Right. Yeah. But again, it's, it's still, it's not passive. So, you know, I used to come in hard and fast, right. freak people out. Never, that just didn't really help. But if you come in too soft and it's like, I'm going to accept whatever you say to me yeah. and then we're going to go back to the way it was, we can't do that either. Yeah. It's it's that fine balance of like directness. I'm not going to let this kind of float. I do have a purpose for bringing this conversation up, which is yeah. clarity yeah. and understanding. And most people, because most people are intentional about this, great book, thanks for the feedback. 
you know, I went through that with my team a while ago, aren't trained in the ability to say like, I'm going to take your question in, process my defense response, Mm -hmm. the trigger, let it kind of subside. And then I might ask you a question or come with like, to be honest, I haven't really thought about it, but I hear what you're saying. Here's maybe what it could be that they're not always going to have the right answer right away. Take any constraints or expectations off this and just know Lean into hard conversations and do it with curiosity. Absolutely. And you'll do it right. Some people receive it well. And just accept whatever comes from it. Because it's just it's probably not always going to go very smoothly every time. And that's why these are called hard conversations. <laughs> yes. right? We're talking about pursuing hard conversations. But, you know, again, we get to interact with hundreds, thousands of advisors. And almost every single one of them needs to have a hard conversation. Mm-hmm. And... That includes you who are listening or watching, and we just want to encourage and empower you. It's hard, but it's worth it. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but it's worth it. That that, that you need to, in your relational maturity, in your emotional maturity, in your professional growth, Mm -hmm. you need to pursue and have hard conversations. And I find people that we deal with that are really doing well in this business, Mm -hmm. they are not afraid of hard conversations. They're not jerks. They're not Mm -hmm. mean. They're not overpowering. Mm -hmm. They're, they're not authoritarians where it's like, I'm always right and everyone submit to me. They're just good at initiating hard conversations. Yeah. It, it, it gets it, stuff out of the way. Yeah, and if, you had not, if you've not had a hard conversation with a, an admin, a team member, a junior advisor recently, you're probably missing one. Because when you work with people, <laughs> these are necessary yeah. and good. And so yeah. like for me now, a hard conversation isn't a trigger that like, oh, we're doing something wrong. It's like, oh, good, this is the natural flow of it. And so what we find out in most of the people we coach or speak is that many advisors are completely unaware of the hard conversations until we talk to the admin or the junior <laughs> and they're like, I don't know how to bring this up to them. Yeah. And so just know on your team, try to create an environment where you say, hey, I'm curious, I'm looking for good feedback. Because if you're not, these conversations are stewing yeah. and, and they're not helping. Absolutely. Well, as always, thanks for watching the show and we really appreciate, we've gotten some great, uh, I'll have them for the next show, I forgot to print them off this time, but got some really cool reviews lately of nice. people on iTunes, so really appreciate those. Um, and uh, we just we just appreciate the time that people have taken to listen. And uh, we want to encourage you, if you go to howtochargelive.com, howtochargelive.com, registration is open for our September event. Nice. And um, it's going to be phenomenal, and we have limited seating. So uh, go there and check it out, and we look forward to seeing you in September. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, brother.